This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less tax. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So we have an economy in flux, an economy in crisis. Um, nobody quite knows what's going on in the economy, what's going to go on with real estate, what's going on in the banking sector. And then on top of that, the Democrats and Republicans have decided to fight over the debt ceiling. So in, right in the middle of that. So today, what we're going to discuss, we have an amazing expert on this, um, and I'll let him introduce himself. But seriously, that we got this guest for this topic is simply amazing. Um, we're going to talk about, actually discover, what's what do, what do we see happening over the next six to 12 months in this economy? Um, what is the Fed, not, not what could the Fed do, because we can't control the Fed, but what are they likely to do? And what's likely to happen in the banking sector as well as the real estate sector? So with, with us, we have Mark Calabria, who has an, an amazing resume, including uh, basically handling Fannie Mae Freddie Mac during the pandemic. Um, being Mike Pence's chief economic advisor, and uh, but Mark, I'll let you introduce yourself. Give give a little more of your background because it's pretty impressive. Well, 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 thank you, Tom. Very kind of you to say. And and while I'm currently at the the Cato Institute in Washington D.C., as, as you mentioned, previously ran the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which regulates Fannie and Freddie, and 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 kept that market going during the pandemic, which of course is the topic of my my new book, Shelter from the Storm, how a COVID mortgage meltdown was averted. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's been two years as a chief economist for Vice President Pence. Uh, happy to say during that time did take a, an important role in the 2017 uh, tax reform bill. So for those of you who were able to get tax cuts out of that, you're welcome. <laughs> With you, all, we can always pay lower taxes better. I uh, also worked on trade issues and and relevant as well during my time at the White House. Worked on debt ceiling issues, and you know, happy to kind of talk about um, really what the likely path of that is right now. Uh, and previously on Capitol Hill, but you know, began my career uh, at both National Association of Home Builders, National Association of Realtors, and was re monitoring real estate market. So 25 plus year career of following pretty closely real estate markets. And of course, a proud uh, alumni of George Mason University's PhD economics program. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, uh, Mark. So um, I, I want to start right into to the banking crisis and what's going on, because uh, really, when you look at it, um, if there weren't runs on the banks, the banks would be okay. Um, the, the, bank, you know, let's, I mean, let's, the, the banks have let's, had major billions of dollars being pulled out of them. And uh, I'm, I'm curious why you think that is and what do you think is going on? Let's, let's start with the observation that during COVID, you saw about $5 trillion in deposits enter the system. And the base of that was on a base of $13 trillion. So, you know, almost a 40 some percent increase in deposits during the pandemic. Of course, some of this was, you know, people were getting relief payments. You weren't spending that money on the European vacation. So you're putting in the bank. Now, that was never going to be permanent. Right. You know, some of that was always going to go back. In, and in fact, in about the year leading up to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, you saw about $800 billion, you know, in the posits leave the system. This is first and foremost simply because many of us looked at our near zero return on deposits and said, you know, at worst, you can get 4 you know, four percent in your in, in three month T bills. Why would you leave something in the bank? And so one takeaway from this my view is you're going to see another trillion probably leave the deposit banking system over the next year. Uh, that's going to have a lot of stress on these institutions. So the biggest uh, decline is really going to be those institutions that were heavily dependent on uninsured deposits like Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, the big takeaway is that while Silicon Valley Bank had about half a dozen problems wrong with it, you know, most banks only have like one or two of those. So you've got a core part of the banking system you know, I do expect another four or five regionals to get in serious trouble, you know, if not outright fail. Um, they've got very thin capital, and the reality is they're heavily dependent on short-term funding via uninsured deposits, and they've got a lot of long-dated securities, treasuries, mortgage-backed securities 
that have declined in value because of interest rate changes. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's talk about that just for a second yeah. here. Let's get really basic here. What's really happened is the banks have taken short-term deposits, which are really like a short-term loan. That's yeah, what a deposit is. It's a short-term loan. In fact, it's a demand loan, meaning that the 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 lenders, meaning the depositors, can pull that money out anytime they want, uh, in, immediately. I mean, that they, they, they don't have to ask permission. They don't have to do anything. They just pull it out. And so that basically the bank has this line of credit with their depositors and the depositors uh, and the depositors are making no money on it. So then what the bank does is they put it into long-term securities because the long-term securities were doing, you know, three, 4% well, and they weren't paying anything on it. So, so the banks are, are like, they've got all this excess money they're they're putting it into long term deposits and that's really what caught them off guard right that's absolutely the case but you know an important takeaway is not every bank handled it in the same way so almost every bank in covid saw a huge influx in deposits and of course banks like silicon valley saw even a bigger influx now silicon valley bank was a bank that took all these deposit flows coming in and put them into long dated securities and bad timing took off the hedges they were trying to hedge that interest rate risk and they took off their hedges of course to try to be more profitable just as rates were going up so just when you didn't want to take away your hedging position now you know a lot of bigger institutions or even smaller institutions might have taken those deposits and say put them in reserves at the fed which you know essentially you know you're matching your duration deposits are short term reserves at the fed are short term you don't have any duration risk and so it's important to recognize that the business strategy of Silicon Valley Bank was is not the norm. So you should not take away from this that the entire system is cratering down because that's not the case. But again, they weren't they were an outlier, but they weren't alone in some of these practices, which is why I say there has to be a couple more a couple more shoes to fall. You know, another big takeaway, we've seen a lot of reports come out of this by the Federal Reserve and FDIC and others. And, you know, you know, the, the probably biggest thing the investor needs to take away is you really have to have faith in the management at a bank. If you've got, you know, uninsured deposits or you've got significant business relationship. And, I, you know, I'm a former financial regulator, so it pains me to say this. But if you think the regulators are going to catch these problems before you're too late, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And so there is a degree of your own due diligence you simply need to do. And I would put it this way. You know, if you feel that management is untrustworthy or, or incompetent or, 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 you know, you have the slightest qualms about management at a bank, take your business somewhere else. Because, again, by the time the regulators figure it out, it, it's too late. Uh, and so, again, I do want to emphasize this isn't a system wide effect. Um, and some of this, of course, is regulatory reasons. You know, banks were highly incentivized to hold long dated assets, right. but most of them kind of figured. And, and it is certainly worth saying uh, Chairman Powell at the Fed has raised rates uh, at a rate that is is almost unprecedented. So, you know, other banks are able to figure this out. Uh, I know the CEO of um, Silicon Valley Bank has been out there kind of blaming it all on the Fed. You know, who knew rates were going to go up so much? Well, I mean, that happens in banking. It certainly happened in the 80s. It ha it's, it's not unhistoric. And you got to be prepared for that interest rate risk. Uh, but again, the big takeaway is there's a lot of there's a lot of variance among banks and, and you need to do your homework and, and don't treat the sector. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, J.P. Morgan bought First Republic, got a great deal from what it looks like. And, yep. and, and so there will be deals, there will be winner, winners uh, and there will be losers. And of course, being well diversified is the best you know, advice you can be and don't have it all in one institution. But again, be weary of banks that grow really quickly. And you saw over the pandemic, Silicon Valley Bank tripled in size. That is a red flag um, for any any type of financial institution. That might be fine in, in the in the tech world, but that's not that's a red flag in the banking world. Okay. So so let's look at down the road, next six months, six to 12 months. What do you see in the banking world? I mean you, you said you're going to see a, a few more banks probably fail, um, the regional banks. Um, but what do you what will for example, will the Fed continue to raise rates? Because there's been some indication just in the last little bit that they are going to continue to raise rates. Um, they, I mean, logically, they would need sure. to raise rates higher than inflation in order to bring down inflation, and they haven't done that yet. So, what do you see coming in the next six to twelve months? 
they're they're getting close with that. So let's let's do if you will, a little backward induction, and to keep in mind that the Fed is, despite claims otherwise, a political institution. And the relevance here is that um, you'd really have to have extremely high inflation or extremely strong economic disturbances in an election year for the Fed to do much of anything. So their strategy 2024 is largely going to be to sit on their hands with a few targeted assistance at financial institutions, but they will. So my point being, and they're going to look at next year as starting actually December, November. So latest you would see a rate increase will be the September meeting. I think we've got at least one more increase coming. Uh, so you'll either get the last rate increase in my opinion, will either be September or July for the fed. And after that, again, situation could change and the economy could get worse and they could cut rates, but I really don't see them cutting rates until really 2025. And I don't see them getting to their inflation target until early 2025 either. So we'll still have, you know, three, four percent inflation at a minimum for the rest of the year with a couple more rate increases that will be quarter point. So they're not done yet. And they are willing to see a little bit of, of stress. And the best parallel to this is you know, we, we kind of forget that while Paul Volcker broke the back of inflation in the 80s, he also engaged in, in a number of bailouts of financial institutions. And, and there was a sense of, well, you know, we're going to break some eggs to, you know, tackle inflation and then we'll bail them out, you know, in the back end. And that's what we're seeing now with Silicon Valley Bank and others. And that's what we're going to see going forward. So there will likely be assistance provided to banks from the government. There'll be some allowed mergers. And this is where, you know, people, you know, JP Morgan is an example of somebody who's come out of this okay and will likely come out better. And for a number of regionals and the bigger banks, there'll be purchase opportunities that will actually be probably value enhancing. So there will be some good purchases, but you know, it's how do you figure that out? Which one is going to take some some due diligence? Well, yeah, you, so, UBS UBS seems to have come out okay with this too. Yeah, they, ex exactly, they'll be they'll, they'll be winners. Things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so 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 let me ask you this question. So you think? Um, so what do you think that um, interest rate is going to get to? And when you when you look at um, that target interest rate and you think it's going to hold for a year, year and a half, what do you think that target rate is? I think we're looking at another probably 75 basis points of an increase, you know, and that, and again, it, keep in mind too, that the Fed really has the biggest lever on short-term rates in that the longer term rates are also impacted essentially by inflation expectations. So if the Fed is successful at taming those inflation expectations, and I don't really think they're there yet. I mean, you know, we're all right, rightly to be skeptical that given how behind the curve the Fed was, you don't quite want to believe that they're there yet. But you could you could actually start to see rates moderate in the long end of the curve. So if you're you're borrowing for uh, mortgages or long-term business or even a seven, 10 year time frame in terms of a small business loan, those rates could start to moderate in the next six months, but you're gonna start to see short-term rates come up. And of course, an inverted yield curve is always very difficult for the banking industry and the financial services industry writ large. So you're gonna see some bumps. Now, of course, one of the big takeaways from the recent bank failures is um, there's nothing like a bank failure to embarrass the regulators. And when in regulators get embarrassed, they overreact in the other direction. And you're already seeing a tightening of credit. So, you know, if you're involved in commercial real estate, it's going to be much tougher to get commercial real estate loan by an acquisition development, construction lending. All of this stuff is going to get a lot tougher and already is getting tougher for the next, you know, 12 to six months. And of course, that's notwithstanding that there are certain parts of that market like like the apartment build, building market where I already believe for overbuilt. Of course, should caveat, it really depends on location. Uh, you know, we are obviously in this uh, weird environment where, you know, Bay Area of California, coastal California property markets fallen off a cliff, but, you know, Florida is doing great. So, you know, you really, the old, the old adage, location, location, location matters more now than ever. Yeah. So, so let's get into uh, real estate a little bit because we're seeing a, phenomenon that we've seen before, which is where what the sellers are doing, what the sellers think something's worth and what the buyers think something's worth is very different. So our cap rates have not caught up with the interest rates. So we now we have cap rates lower than interest rates, which means you have negative leverage, which means that you're not going to buy something 
in that scenario. So how long do you think it'll take? We, we've seen one or two big defaults. How, how, how long do you think it's going to be before we see more and more defaults or um, basically selling it back either to the bank or at a deep discount? So I think we've got another 12 months of the commercial real estate market really going through some distress. And so whether it's REITs that are going to have a lot of problems in that in that environment, uh, certainly some of the uh, banks that are have really exposed. And again, you know, one of the big problems at Signature Bank in New York that failed was their commercial real estate. And they were very big, you know, multifamily lenders and, and were heavily exposed in that in area. And you're really just starting to see the stress in the apartment market, uh, but the office retail market has been under stress for some time. And again, you're a year away from having this truly shake out. So, you know, while there were deals to be had in any market, and again, I really do emphasize that there's such regional variance in this that it's going to depend on where you're at. But from a national perspective, I mean, I think for the real estate market, the best thing to do right now is sit on the sidelines. Because again, prices will adjust, they just haven't yet. And you haven't had that flow through the rest of the supply chain. So while some materials, I mean, lumber, aluminum, these things are, have come down considerably, it's still pretty expensive to build. You haven't fully seen an adjustment in land prices. So to me, you know, we're not at the point where the market has adjusted enough uh, to be attractive to get back into the real estate market. But again, I think this is something where you can see that you know, over a 12 month period. And, and again, but I do want to emphasize there's, there's deals in every market, yeah, uh, cash but, buyers, you know, this is something where it may be a great environment for cash buyers. You know, of course the problem for a lot of real estate is, you know, anybody with a mortgage is sitting on a pretty low rate and they understand the value of the property is not what it was. Um, but I think we're still third or fourth inning of uh, the adjustment in commercial real estate. Okay. So, so, um, my understanding is we're about 87% of uh, commercial real estate mortgages out there are adjustable rate mortgages. And so yep. what we saw was they had a rate cap that they bought for $80,000 um, a year ago, and today it's $3 million. So that that's what's, that's what's hurting them so much. So you're going to see this continuing to go on for the next 12 months, where really you're going to have these probably just more and more capital calls in the real estate market. Um, you're going to have to put more capital in really just to make the banks comfortable with the rate caps. And the banks are going to take some hits here. And, and, and you raise it, you know, it's a great point to remember that unlike the single family market where you may typically get a 30 year fixed, that, that's not the commercial real estate market. You know, if you get a fixed, maybe you're fixed for five, six, seven years, right. 10, at, 10 at most really, but the norm is going to be more a five to seven year period. And so, yeah, you're having commercial property deals that were done at very low rates five, six years ago, start to reset. And, and again, it's going to be extremely painful. You know, we've also seen in the last couple of years, sort of like debt service ratios edge up in, in, in many parts of the market. So there's going to be some distress. Some banks are going to take some hits. Uh, you know, the, you're going to get a lot of pressure, however, if, if there's a silver lining to this, uh, banks do not want those properties. So you're going to see a lot of bending over backwards. You know, and if you unfortunately find yourself in the position of being the owner of one of these properties, it's not pleasant to have that reset, but you do have leverage with the bank. They don't want the property. Uh, the, the the willingness to work out will be there for a while. So be an aggressive negotiator. Of course, um, you know, don't make it so hard that you're not going to be able to get to a deal. But but there are workout opportunities with these institutions. And of course, the other side of this is it really just like if you think about the, the real money to be made 2010, 2011 was in the distressed property market. You know, and you think about like the invitation right. homes and, co and companies like that. And of course, individual buyers who came in in those markets. And so you're going to see distressed re commercial real estate is going to be a great buy an opportunity if you do your due diligence. So there, there's that silver lining. So, so let me let me go back to um, something you said earlier. I want to make sure everybody, our listeners understand what you were talking about. And that's the inverted yield curve. I think that is something that people don't quite get. The yield curve is really just the grafting of short-term, long-term rates. So if you think about, you know, it's usually, it's usually upward sloping because of course, and usually uh, lenders like to get paid more to, to, to take advantage, to compensate for being 
told to wait longer to get their money back. So short-term rates tend to be higher than long-term, short, lower than uh, long-term rates. And in VOD and Euro curve is when you have the opposite, when short-term rates are actually above long-term rates. Mm-hmm. In A, this tends to be historically a pretty good predictor of recessions, in part because it also tends to put a lot of stress on banks. And if you think about like Silicon Valley Bank, your short-term deposits, so you're, you're, you're pricing your deposits off the short end of the market, but you've got these long dated assets like treasuries and mortgage backed mm-hmm. securities. Normally, your deposits are going to cost you less than your long dated assets. But when you hit an inverted yield curve, you're suddenly paying more to borrow than you're getting on your assets, which means, of course, you're losing money. And that's part of what hit Silicon Valley Bank as well. It's it's fundamentally what blew up Bear Stearns back in 2008 was an inverted yield curve. Not to set aside that they also at that time had problems in their commercial real estate portfolio. But anybody who really in, you know, we saw this in 2020, there are a lot of handful of mortgage REITs that, you know, their funding is overnight repurchase or repo. And so they're very exposed and they hold long dated mortgage backed securities. So I would say any if you're investing in something where the funding mechanism is extremely short term overnight and they're invested in long dated assets, it's going to be a rough ride. Got it. So one other thing, thank you. That was a terrific explanation. Thank you. Um, uh, one other thing you mentioned was about uh, Paul Volcker, and he's credited with breaking the back of inflation. Um, but something else happened, and it wasn't just Paul Volcker. Ronald Reagan, at the same time, enacted tax cuts. And you yeah. mentioned um, earlier that uh, you'd been part of the 2017 tax cuts. And what we see right now is uh, actually an administration that wants to raise taxes as opposed to cut taxes. So well, what's the relationship that you see between the you know the tax system and what's going on in the economy? I mean, so let me let put it in two buckets. We'll put it in in the broad and then in the particular because you know part of you know the the boom we're seeing in multifamily construction today is is the biggest since we've seen since the seventies and eighties. And the early eighties was in part driven by tax changes. So eighty one, eighty two, exactly. there were tax tax changes. I mean, it was crazy enough in the early eighties where you could do uh, commercial real estate deals that were actually money losers, but you'd still make money because of the tax right. offsets. It, I mean, it was it was bad tax policy. And of course, the 86 Tax Act unwound that, but the side impact of the 86 Tax Act was to pull the, pull the air out of the bubble in real estate, which of course was extremely painful, but you had to do it in, in, eventually. Uh, and so you, and so that's the, the specific. And so there are conversations. I mean, this administration, for instance, has proposed to get rid of 1031, you know, the starker exchanges. Mm-hmm. But again, I want to emphasize, I think that's extremely unlikely to happen. But part of the, you know, debt ceiling negotiation is the administration is asking for some changes to what they call tax loopholes. I certainly don't necessarily think 1031 is a loophole. It's something Congress intended to do. It's, it's a code section. It's, by every, definition, every, it's not a loophole. Every, 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 every person's deduction is somebody else's loophole. So I, I do appreciate that the tension there. Um, so you certainly have seen, and it's also we're saying we've seen record increases in taxes already. You know, part of what came out of Inflation Reduction Act was minimum tax increases for corporations. Yep. So I do think that the 2017, what we were fundamentally trying to do, particularly on the corporate side, was incentivize greater investment and incentivize money to come back to America. You know, you remember the, right. the companies Absolutely. like that. Yeah, the people who would park a lot of money in Ireland and stuff like that. Well, we incentivize bringing it home so it can be invested here. And I do think that's contributed to the strength of the economy. And I worry about, you know, this administration is really focused on raising corporate taxes and raising taxes on, on, on individuals who invest. And they're very skeptical of, of of corporate gains. And so there are, but, you know, if there's a silver lining, I think their ability to do much of this is going to be limited. But, of course, they've hired a bunch of new agents. And I think the reality is that people should expect to have a much higher probability of being audited. So the administration sure. does believe that they're going to raise taxes by simply scrutinizing individuals more heavily. Uh, and so this is certainly an environment where I would say, um, don't ride the line. You're asking well, for your, you're well, asking for trouble. For here, this here's, here's, here's part of the challenge with what's going on at the IRS that I see um, as a tax guy um, is that these new auditors are not going to have a lot of training. 
So they're going to come in with a checklist. And if you don't match their checklist, they're going to give you an assessment. And then you have to take it to court. And that's very expensive. So what's going to happen is taxpayers are going to pay um, assessments that really are not valid assessments. For example, I, I think- we have we have we have, we have two um, two issues right now going on: uh, the conservation easement and the captive insurance that are not loopholes. They are in the code. Yep. They are very specifically in the code, and they have public policy behind them. And yet, you have the IRS just says that we don't like them. And because we don't like them, we're going to disallow them. It not not that the taxpayers done anything wrong, but simply that we don't like them. So, how much of that do you see coming with those all those new audits? I, mean, I see a lot, and, and, and so you're certainly right that the administration is taking kind of a trying to change policy via enforcement. Uh, and obviously, there are a lot of things in the tax code where, you know, I, I don't want to say. There's great, you know, if you're getting something assessed, you know, what is the appraised value of, of whether it's property for a conservation easement or if you're if you're gifting a property? That's a fair or, question. And these things, I mean, there is wiggle room. So my bottom line advice would be as much as it sucks, um, the risk is really just high right now from an enforcement point of view that my recommendation would be to take it to, to suck it up and take a conservative view of valuations which means you're going to leave money on the table, which is a tax increase, right. which is unfortunate, but it is a better path to the penalties. And and, and this is an administration that's going to go after people, particularly if you are a small business owner, you're self-employed, you know, there's going to be much bigger scrutiny. And, and I don't like it, but again, the advice I have to give people is err toward, you know, the side of safety um, and be a little less aggressive than you might be tax planning in normal years. All right. Um, not music to my ears. No, that's not the, I mean, I, I'm trying to help. Try to keep you out of trouble, Tom. You know what? Here's the challenge. The challenge is the law is the law and the IRS doesn't get to make the law. They just think they get to make the law. Um, but let, let me go to one more, more little thing that a lot of people haven't noticed, but I think it's in a major policy change, which is these new fees for good credit. When you're taking out a a mortgage. First of all, would you quickly explain it and what's going on and why in the world would you punish somebody who's done the right thing? So since about the since about the 80s, you know, we've developed a system, a mortgage market where, you know, pricing of mortgages more and more reflects risk. I mean, before the 1980s, you, you largely had one price. And if you were bad credit, you didn't get a mortgage. Now it's the case where if you're a bad credit, you can get a mortgage and you pay more. And over time, that has become more and more more a tighter relationship. So again, you have a strong credit as in a strong FICO or Vantage or whatever the metric might be, you pay a lower rate. So the administration has put a proposal out there that would still be risk-based, but less so. So they're trying to flatten that relationship. And the intention absolutely is to subsidize poorer credit borrowers. That's something they're trying to do. That's something they're geared at. And of course, it's the administration that decides that you don't need to pay your student loan for three plus years. So, I mean, it really is meant to try to turn our financial system into a a subsidy system, which I think is very problematic. You know, obviously, many of us have worked very hard to get good credit. Um, You know, many of us have taken years to build up big credit. And again, I want to be very clear. Don't go worrying your credit because you think you're going to get a better mortgage rate. That's not the case. You still want to have good credit, but the reward for having good credit in the mortgage market will be less than it is otherwise. And but an important, also important to keep in mind, especially if you're you're high net wealth or you're in the jumbo market, this applies to Fannie and Freddie loans. So if, the, if if it's a lender that's a portfolio lender, like someone like Chase, who may make it and keep it on their balance sheet or jumbo market. What this actually means is you have a greater incentive now to shop around. You yeah. really, so so definitely, if you get quoted a rate, don't take that as necessarily the best rate because that may be the Fannie and Freddie rate. And again, if you're getting a loan that's in excess of, of really not even plus the million loan limit, but if it's in excess of six or $700,000 for a mortgage, you may get a much better deal from a portfolio lender. So again, I disagree with the policy. I can tell you agree with me, Tom. But the takeaway for you know people at wealth management is it pays to shop around more now than ever. Great, thank you. So um, 
Mark Calabria, the book is Shelter from the Storm, How a COVID Mortgage Meltdown Was Averted. Um, there we go. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And just remember, this macroeconomics is important to us because it determines microeconomics. And so you, you can't really operate your business. You can't uh, look at um, your cash flow without looking at what's going on in the banking system, the Federal Reserve, et cetera. So thank you so much, Mark. Um, and thank you all uh, for listening. Remember, when you get this kind of broad education, uh, which becomes specific education, you're always going to make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.